Okay, let's have a look now at the role of separation in air pollution dose for active mode commute. I'm just looking at the time. Okay, so let's go back to this study here where we looked at the concentration for those seven modes, right? And what we saw, I, I talked about it briefly before, the scooter and the car, they're going down the middle of the road, right? The bus and the bike tend to be down the side of the road, so the bus is in its bus lane. The bicycle is often in shared with the bus lane. The bicyclists take that because they don't like the big buses, but they tend to be sort of off to the side. The walker and the runner on the footpath, yeah? And the train is separated maybe 20 meters or so um, from the road. So when we look at the average concentration, it decreases as you go away from the road. Okay, and in fact, we often see pictures like this in the literature which show sort of zone of greatest exposure. So the concentrations tend to be high in the middle of the road and somehow drop off the further you go, um, further you go away. So this got me to think about a bit of a problem. We're in a situation in New Zealand and in many places around the world where we want more people to be walking and cycling. In fact, we got the wrong answer. We can't convince people now you should cycle and you should um, walk because it's good for your health. Well, you still get the exercise, but certainly from an air pollution point of view, it's not helpful. So what can we do to make it better for people? And in fact, how can we make it fair? The car, car people are making all the pollution. The cyclists and the runners are the ones who are getting more dose than what the people are in the cars. So the question is, what can we do in order to ensure that it's more fair so that the people driving in the car have the same dose as the people cycling and walking, right? And looking at that drop off away from the road, the question is how far away from the road, so think about this carefully, how far away from the road does the cyclist need to be and how far away from the road does the walker need to be so that when you take into account their reduced concentration because they're further away, their increased travel time and their increased breathing rate so the dose is the same as somebody going by car. Does this make sense? How far does that actually need to be? Because if it's not very far, then hey, it's possible to provide that infrastructure for people. If the answer is 100 meters, then it's not going to be, it's not going to be reasonable unless you have people traveling through the park, right? So what's the question of meters? Is it 10 meters? Is it 100 meters? Okay, so that was our research question. So we chose a little um, stretch of road. Um, it called me on a road at the back of Motat 2. <laughs> might remember this. Um, so it's a sort of a suburban road. I mean, this is fairly typical in New Zealand of a road. Road here, it's a footpath. Okay, so we, we chose this particular site because there was a nice there and back loop, a little roundabout at the end, and so it was easy to turn around. So essentially what we had, we had, we had one person traveling by car, we had one tra person traveling by bike, we had one person traveling on the footpath, and all of them had a portable air pollution monitor on them. And they walked up and down, or cycled up and down, or drove up and down for an hour. Okay, so it turned out that the cyclist, or the cyclist did three times as many there and back as the walker, and the car driver did three times as many there and back as the cyclist, is roughly how it worked out. Um, and so then we compared the air pollution concentrations for those three, um, three commuters. So this is what we got. This is just an example of the, the time series. So the motorist is the person going by car, cyclist, and pedestrian, slightly funny order. But what you can see from this is that the, this is what we expect. The air pollution concentrations for the person going by car are the highest, down the middle of the road, yeah? Slightly lower for the, uh, the cyclist, off to the side, and lower again for the pedestrian, off to the side, even further onto the footpath. Another thing you notice is that for the cyclist you still get quite big peaks in concentration and for the pedestrian quite big peaks that you don't get with the car because remember the person driving in the car has got a box around them so they get protected from those spikes in pollution. Um, so despite the mean being higher, the peak is actually lower than the other two. Okay, but those were your average concentrations. So what we did with those, and we did, we actually had 10 days and we got a huge range of different meteorological conditions from being very windy to completely calm to everything in between. So we're really lucky that we got the, the complete range during those two weeks. 
And so here's our, here's our question. We've got our car, we've got our cyclist, we've got our pedestrian. If you look at those concentrations in terms of means, they're dropping away from the middle of the road, right? Highest for the car, then the cyclist, and then the pedestrians. And, but, if you look at the dose, the, um, the person going by foot would take three times as long as the cyclist. The cyclist goes to takes three times as long as the person going by car. So the dose would, even for the same concentration, need to be multiplied by nine, just for the time. And then also the breathing rate, which was, I forget what, four or five, I think, for the, for the, for the different active mode commuters. So an increase in dose. So the question was, how far do they need to be in order to have a similar dose? Any ideas? I didn't have any idea either. But actually, do you, want to know, do you want to know the answer? There we go, that's what we wanted was equal dose. Yeah. So it turned out that the cyclists, I mean, this is only for this particular road, it might be completely different for another road. But for our road, essentially the cyclist only needed to be maybe two or three meters further away. And the, the walker only needed to be maybe one or two meters away further and they would end up having the same dose as the person driving by car. So quite reasonable really, not completely ridiculous. Depends, I mean, depends if it's a, if it's a very built up urban environment, you know, two meters is not gonna happen. But if it's a new development in a new suburb and there's space is not so tight, then it's quite realistic to just move it out just a little bit further and that could make a huge difference. And it turned out that this particular, just by chance, this particular stretch of road was due for being re renovated, um, upgraded, and it turns out that this was the plan that they had in mind. Um, so it's not exactly what I discovered. I would have preferred to have the cyclist the other side of the park car, but hey, it's an improvement. And they pushed out the footpath a little bit further, so you're kind of 80% there, so I was really pleased um, that they did that. And of course, okay, so that, that's an environment, like I said, in the suburbs where you've got opportunities to um, have a bit more space and expand. Of course, there's plenty of urban environments where you haven't got that, um, that luxury. But there was another study that was done actually quite some time ago now, in 2005, in central London. And this was actually the one that got me thinking about kind of where people, where people are um, and how that impacts on their, on their air pollution dose. So in this particular study, in central London, they had people walking up and down on the footpath, um, and they had one person walking just on the edge of the road, right, right next to the traffic, and then they had another person walking right next to the buildings on the footpath. Okay, so possibly, I don't know, maybe three or four meters difference between road edge and building edge. And they walked up and down on the footpath and looked at their exposures. And what they found for this particular study was that exposure was significantly higher when pedestrians walked along the curbside edge of the pavement in comparison to the building side for the ultrafine particle counts. So even in an urban environment, if you've got the opportunity to walk just a few meters closer to the building and further away from the exhaust, that can have a significant impact. So even little things, little behavior changes can actually have um, an impact on people. So I was really interested, actually, based on the study that we that I just showed for our New Zealand study. Um, I did a trip to Innsbruck in Austria for a noise conference, actually, and I saw this footpath, and I got very excited because <laughs> these guys, these, these Austrians, already knew, didn't they? They'd already they'd already discovered this because their layout was road, rows of trees, cycling, and pedestrians were separate. So this is perfect. This is equal dose based on what we found. So. It's a really nice um, setup. It's also safer from the point of view of accidents if you're, if you're off the roads. So the cyclists love it. It's much, much safer than being with traffic. You also don't have car doors opening, which is a big hazard in many places for cyclists. And then there again, this is, can't quite see it's a bit dark, this one, but this is in The Hague in the Netherlands. So this road over here, interestingly enough, this motorcycle is allowed to go on the cycling path which is a bit unusual, but anyway, apparently, I guess he seemed pretty happy. He wasn't wearing a helmet, so I guess maybe motorcycles are treated the same as bicycles. And there's the footpath here, so a layout that's sort of conducive to um, helping with air pollution and exposure. Okay. 
And this is just an example in Auckland of a, of a path that got put in next to the motorway for cycling. So this is to try and encourage more people to cycle to work. So this is just the photo of it at this place here. There's a, here's the motorway. There's a little fence and there's the, the cycle path. So in some places the cycle path is right next to the motorway and often with not much of a barrier. We've done some studies looking at the different types of barriers and how they impact on what the exposure is. So if you have a row of trees or you have a, a, a solid fence, how does that impact? Um, and interestingly enough, often the barriers that are put up next to motorways, and there's lots of them in Hong Kong, um, are noise barriers. But a side effect of that is that you've also got protection um, in terms of air pollution. Though I did see yesterday when I was traveling on a shuttle bus, <laughs> where they had a noise barrier coming over the side of the motorway and the footpath was on the, was on the road side. So it would have been much better to have the footpath going around the back of it in terms of protecting people. Maybe it wasn't possible. Um, but here's just an example of, yeah, this is preferable here, um, around the middle of the path, where the, the path is quite separate from the motorway. That's an improvement from the point of view of, of air pollution exposure. And this is another thing that's going on all over Auckland to try and encourage more people to cycle. They did a survey a little while ago to find out what are the, so they asked people whether they were current cyclists, yes, no. And if they said no, they asked them, would you cycle under certain conditions? And the people that said yes, they asked them, what is it about cycling that's preventing you from cycling? What would make you cycle? Or how could, you know, what changes could we make that might make the difference to you cycling? And one of the things that people mentioned was having a separate cycleway like this, so having it separated somehow. And so this is an example of the sort of thing that's going on in Auckland to try and help encourage cycling and to protect people a little bit. <clears throat> and I was very pleased to see this in Victoria Park. I got very excited because I'm a, I'm a runner. And so it's nice, I've never seen a jogging only trail before. Fantastic. But of course people that are running are breathing hard more so than walking, and probably more so than um, cycling, maybe. And it was just nice to see that in a park in the middle of the city, there was somewhere that people could jog that was away from the road, I mean, it's near the middle of the park, so, um, so that's really great. Okay, so let's now have a look at, look at route choice. Okay, so this was a study that was done, actually just came out just recently, uh, a study done in Edinburgh where the people were comparing three different routes to work, so from home to work, and it was on it was a cyclist and they had basically had an air pollution monitor on the bicycle, traveled from home to work, and compared three different routes. One was on a main road, one was on a not so main road, and one was sort of the, the back route um, into into work. And he compared the three. So here's your here's your map. So the purple is the main road, the green is the, the lesser route, and the, the red route is the leisurely route. And what they found in their study when they looked at average concentrations was that the main route produced the highest concentrations and the green one the middle and the red one the lowest, not too surprising. But it does show that different routes, um, you can have different, um, different exposures, so you can actually improve in terms of how much air pollution you bring by taking a, a route that's away from busy traffic. Um, the other thing that's important, so this is on the main route, um, because often when you have spikes in pollution, so this was the time series, right? So this is time on all the x-axis and concentration on the y-axis. They must have had a camera on them as well. And what they did was to track, um, to see if they could find a reason why the spikes would have occurred. And what you can see from this is often when you have a spike, it's because there's a bus overtaking, or what did you have? Ex excavator and circular saw, um, cycling behind a passenger car. So there's usually a reason for those spikes. Um, and if you can avoid those, then obviously that's going to help. We've done a little bit of work, mainly, it's a little bit more from a theoretical point of view, looking at route optimization. And in our case, we were looking at pollution uptake and travel time. So if you look at this scenario here, there's three different options. Looking at it from an air pollution point of view, your best option is the red route, right? Okay? The purple one gave the lowest concentrations, the red one gave the lowest concentrations. 
But that red road is quite a bit further to travel, right? So maybe if somebody's running late for their lecture, they might choose the purple road and not the red road. So they're going to make a decision based on their particular circumstances. So we've done a little bit of work looking at cyclists' um, boot optimization, where we've pretty sort of left it to the person to decide what's important. If you're not in a hurry, you might decide that air pollution is more important, time is not, not important on that day or for that person. Or you might say, I'm already late, I want the route that's going to get me there the quickest, I don't care about air pollution. And then you can choose what your best route is. So for example here, this is your long travel time, but low air pollution, down at this end. So it'll give you the route details. Down at this end, it's short travel time, so it's very quick, but the air pollution levels might be really high. And then there's a bunch of different op options that sort of fit on that minimum, that minimum curve. What that means is there's options like Route 9 right at the top, which is not a good option, because there's another route that'll take you the same amount of time where the air pollution is much, much lower. So it gives you a range of conditions that are optimum, which you can choose. And so there's work that's being done around the world looking at this, not just air pollution uptake and travel time, but other things like cost, right? Um, and environmental friendliness, maybe. Or there's, there's different things you can put in there in terms of optimization that can suit the particular person. So you might have someone who's, for example, who's elderly, They've got plenty of time to get from A to B. Um, and you can, sorry, you could do it for different mode choices as well. So not just cycling. You might put in car, bus, train, walking, cycling. Somebody who's elderly doesn't mind how long it takes to get from A to B because they've got plenty of time. Maybe cost is an issue. Maybe they don't want to have to train, change bus or change train halfway. So for them, having limited changes is really important. So then you can provide what's the optimum route for them based on their circumstances. Whereas somebody else may have a car, they want to get from A to B as quickly as possible, don't care about the parking costs, that's their best choice, you know, and, and vice versa. So lots of interesting stuff to be done in the space looking at um, um, travel route optimization. <clears throat> so we've done some other work looking at, watch the time, um, looking at children walking to school. And in this particular study, we were interested in looking at which side of the road that you walk on and how that influences your exposure. So we looked at a road where nearly all of the traffic was going in one direction and very little going in the other direction. So this is your rush hour traffic heading into the city. And so we had a route where we had a very quiet bit of street and then we had the main road and we had one person walking on the busy side and then we had one person walking on the side with not much traffic and we compared exposures. So this is what we got. So this is the quiet cul-de-sac, hardly any cars going past. Du, 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 du. Then you hit the main road. One person crosses over, and the other person stays on the quiet side. And you can see all those spikes are associated with being on the busy side of the road, often because a bus has gone past. Okay, so you can get quite a different exposure depending on even just which side of the road you choose to walk on. And this is the sort of thing that we found. It's really a morning rush hour problem. So busy road, busy side of the road, quiet side of the road in the morning. High concentration on the busy side, lower concentrations on the quiet side. In the afternoon, it really doesn't make too much difference because there's no rush hour traffic anymore and the traffic flow is roughly equal. So it's very much a walking uh, in the morning problem. We did another similar study in the UK in a city called Bradford. And same idea, start together. So here we had air pollution monitors, 820 we left home, walking together. It's always nice when your measurements match, when you walk side by side, <laughs> it's always a good check. Match, match, match. Here's where one of them crossed the road, the other side of the road. Um, so we had a segment here. That's the interesting bit actually, and then together a bit with the intersection, and then separated again. The most interesting bit from this study was that little segment there. One of the walkers, was walking alongside traffic that was stalled and queued up for the traffic lights. So all these cars, one behind the other, just idling, waiting at the lights. The green person was just walking on the opposite side of the road, so they would have been five, six meters away, and they missed all of those spikes in pollution. So even just choosing to walk on the side that's not near the queued up traffic, 
can have a huge difference in terms of exposure. You can imagine with children, if they're choosing the same route every day, right, maybe 200 days a year for 10 years, you know, that can have a big impact on their lifetime cumulative exposure to air pollution. And of course here, here's just an example of um, someone, one of our students who was walking along busy streets, the black concentrations go up and down. I don't know what happened there, 500,000 parts per cubic centimeters is pretty, pretty high. She didn't know anything in particular. <coughs> she probably would have smelt that one, I would have thought. Um, but then got to a park, walked through a park, and then back onto a road again. Okay, so it shows that when you are walking around town, if you've got the opportunity to take a shortcut through a park or step back from the busy roads, you know, that can make a huge difference. Um, even if it's a question of a few minutes, it's worth just having that, um, having that space. Okay. okay, so increasing the distance between the commuter and the main line of traffic is helpful for reducing, um, reducing exposure. I can see you're all thinking about how you're going to walk home today, aren't you? <laughs> Come across there instead of there this time. But look, look out for the queued traffic and look out for the buses. If you can stay away from them, that's helpful. Okay, so let's move on now to the last topic, which is looking at new transport technologies um, and associated issues. One of the big things that's arrived in Auckland, um, and I haven't seen, I saw a couple down outside the, um, I'm staying down at the Gold Coast, I saw a couple of kids riding on scooters um, down there on the, just on the, on the path of the park. But these have completely taken over Auckland now. Um, so probably, I think it's only maybe three or four months ago, there's a company called Lime Scooters, and they're all over the world now. I haven't seen them in Hong Kong, but all over the US, Europe, Australia. They're basically electric scooters. They're really fun <laughs> electric scooters that you could, they're just, a, what do they call like a ride share, or share, what do they call them? Um, like share bikes, yeah? So you, so you, you, you sign up to an app, and you just tap on the thing, and then you get you have to pay for using it. So it's a, it's a dollar or something to use it, and you get charged per minute. Um, and so you can pick it up wherever. And there's hundreds of these all over the city. You can pick it up, ride to wherever you want to ride, and then dump it and go and you know. And so they're all over the place, but they've become incredibly, incredibly popular, but also incredibly controversial, because now we've got a situation where we've got all these electric scooters that are sharing the footpath with pedestrians and of course there's accidents because these things can go really fast like 30, 40 kilometers per hour and because they arrive so quickly there's no legislation around maximum speeds you know, or the, the city is not designed for them so um, there's all sorts of um, issues going on there people use them, love them because they can get really quickly from one place to another um, but um, people have had lots of accidents with them we have had some technical difficulties with them as well, where some of them have actually broken in half while people have been riding them. <laughs> so there's been those kinds of accidents. I think just recently they've had more problems with them having their brakes lock up all of a sudden and people going over the, over the top of their handlebars. Um, so in fact, <laughs> this was a, an article in the newspaper that came out quite recently, which was documenting all of the accidents um, that had happened. Maybe it doesn't sound like too much for Hong Kong, but Hong Kong's only got a population of 1.5 million. And, and considering that a lot of people might have used them, it's actually quite high numbers in terms of um, rates of accidents for these scooters. So there's lots of controversy, and part of it is, is around not having the right infrastructure to be able to deal with them. Should they be going on the footpath, and there's people walking slowly? People complaining if they go on the road, because we've had accidents involving scooters and cars. Um, what are these scooters doing on the roads where cars belong, you know, so we're just not set up to, um, to deal with them, so it'll come. They're really interesting in the sense that they're really fantastic for distances that are too far to walk, but kind of too close to be bothered taking the cars. They fill a nice little gap between sort of 500 meters and maybe two kilometers. So they're really great. We've actually bought one, so my family's got one of these. So I'm not anti-scooters, but we bought around that doesn't break in half and doesn't have a locking problem. But um, I have to encourage my kids to wear helmets when they're using it right, really slowly. And also tell them that it's important that you give way to all pedestrians, right? You, should, you can go a little bit faster if there's nobody on the footpath. If there's people there, you have to slow right down. But anyway, they've come on the, 
they've come on the, on the market. And so now there's lots of um, arguments around um, the use of shared footpaths. So this is a this was the um, part of the path along the motorway that I showed a little bit earlier. And there's kids going to school. They're on the, these are non-electric. These are the ones that you question it. Those kind of scooters. But there's cyclists. There's people walking. And so now one of the problems is the cyclists. There's too many people walking on the on this path. So the cyclists are complaining. Um, and now what happens is that children no longer want to walk to school using the path because the cyclists are giving them a hard time. So there's arguments between pedestrian cyclists um, and car drivers. So we're not really set up for those different different modes. We need to get ourselves sorted. <clears throat> I put this one in here just because I thought it was amazing. Um, <laughs> but this is a picture of um, in the Netherlands. And this is one place where they really have sorted out um, active active mode commuting in a good way as far as I can tell. So inside this is a little, um, we call it a segue, you know a segue? You just sort of lean and it sort of goes. But inside this little, uh, little container is about eight little children going to preschool. So in this little neighborhood, this is the school bus driver, <laughs> has gone around the neighborhood, picked up all the children from school and is delivering them off home, which is just awesome. And I could not imagine using one of those in Auckland, you know, because the, car, the driving is so fast, right? But the thing they have really well sorted out in the Netherlands um, is they've got, which Auckland's got completely wrong, all our roads look exactly the same. It's always fast, it's wide. In the Netherlands, they have little towns, and in the towns, most of the roads are really narrow like this, and everybody who drives a car drives really slowly, because you can't drive fast, this little, I don't know, there's cobbles and there's people around everywhere. You just have to drive slow. It doesn't make sense to go fast. So the little roads are completely bicycle, pedestrian, segway friendly. And then connecting the little towns are big roads, you know, big roads. And on those roads, they have separate cycleways for the cyclists. So you know where the cycleways need to go. They have to go on those connecting roads. In Auckland, because all our roads are the same, we spent hours arguing about where we should put the cycleway, Does this, should we have one here or should, and so they're not connected, you know, and it doesn't quite work as well. But these, you know, this is, this is pretty cool. And I think this one says it all. So this is in Amsterdam, and I think this one's particularly funny, because look at this guy's face, he's so happy. He's got a car zipping up behind him. I mean, at Auckland you'd be going, oh, is this car gonna come past, is he gonna come too close? But he's perfectly happy, knowing that, you know, he's got right away, he's a cyclist. This is, this is Amsterdam, yeah. So this place is designed, there's people, cycles everywhere, there's people everywhere, there's cars, but cars behave themselves, and it's kind of a shared environment. So in New Zealand, that's really what we need to, need to get to to make it work. Um, and obviously it works because so many people cycle, everybody cycles everywhere. Um, so part of our challenge in Auckland is to get more people cycling so that, you know, it becomes an accepted part of um, the transport system. Just a couple more. In fact, just one more. I was um, looking, I was reading, actually I was watching the television in the hotel I was staying at, and they were doing an article um, on Mexico City where they have this little commute that a lot of people do that often takes about an hour to get from A to B across town. And they decided in Mexico City that the solution was to put in a gondola to get people from one side of the town to another. So now instead of taking an hour to do this big commute, it actually takes people half an hour. And wouldn't that be a lovely way to travel to work? You hop in a gondola, go across the city, come out the other end. So maybe that's the solution to transport problems. Hey, it'd be pretty awesome. Okay, we're done pretty much. Okay, so active mode commuters can be subjected. Hopefully this all makes sense now, crystal clear. Um, active mode commuters can be subjected to some of the highest doses of air pollution amongst all commuters due to their increased breathing rates and often increased time spent in the transport microenvironment, right? Breathing rates, time, as well as concentration. We can do a lot to reduce air pollution dose of active commuters, including the provision of separate cycleways and footpaths and alternative routes away as much as possible from road traffic. Okay, so some of this is about what we provide by the community um, through the transport infrastructure, but it's also about the decisions that you make in terms of where you walk um, <clears throat> and where you go. 
um, careful consideration needs to be made in the design of footpaths and cycleways to make sure they cater for new technology. Because who knows what's around the corner? If you put a gondola in, and you can have segways delivering preschool kids, and you can have electric scooters that suddenly arrive in your city. I mean, who knows what's coming? Little electric sort of um, unmanned vehicles and all sorts of stuff just around the corner. So we need to be sort of aware that those sort of things are coming and I've got to change the way we move around the city. So that's it, thank you.